See, you know, tonight's going to be a little bit kind of like I've always said that a lot of my sermons, even Sunday morning sermons, sometimes end up including kind of like a Sunday school message in there because I think it's important for us to understand uh, certain specific details about the Bible so that we can better start to gain, we can start to understand the deep, some of the deeper things about the Bible. And if we don't understand some of the surface, it makes it difficult for us to dig a little bit deeper. So if you're kind of like a guest tonight and you're new, you know, just, just bear with us. I'll try to make it to where I explain things in such a way that I'll just pretend that, that we're all kind of on the same page and we're still we're kind of getting started. But look, so in Genesis chapter, uh, actually let's go to let's go to Hebrews chapter six and maybe the last verse of Hebrews chapter six, and we're just going to kind of read and we're going to read through the majority of chapter seven also. So as she gets that up there, but last week while she's getting that while she's getting that squared away. We, I kind of talked about, I, well, what I did was I went back to First Chronicles, which is an Old Testament, uh, passage, Old Testament chapter, and it, was, it had a lot of uh, genealogy within it, if you'll remember that. But the, but the narrative part, it started in chapter 10, and it talked about the death of Saul, which was the king, and then it talked about in the next chapter how David became the new king. And we talk about spiritually how David is a type of Christ, and we'll get into that a little bit tonight. I had it in my notes to talk to you about some of those things that that King David was, at least for the children of Israel, you, you understand too, why is it, why do we even talk about that preacher? Why do we talk about Old Testament people, Old Testament Israel, and like here I am in 2022, and I'm living in this modern world. What does Old Testament Israel have anything to do with me? Well, if you're a believer in Christ, if you're a believer in Jesus, then it has a lot to do with you because the people of God, there's always been a people of God on the earth, and me, you and I need to understand understand that. God has always had a witness on the earth. And, and look, to, to break it down real time, I can remember one time I was walking, uh, I was sharing this with somebody the other day. I was walking in the, I think it might have been Mary we were talking, maybe so. And, uh, and, and I was walking on the, on the, what they called the strip in Lafayette. And I was going from one bar to another. And there were three of my friends in front of me. And see, I had already been exposed to Jesus because my sister told me about the Lord. And I had been to church with her on, on more than one occasion, my sister Debbie. And so I had already gone to church at Twin City Gospel. I had already gone to the front and asked the Lord to have mercy on my soul as a kid, not really knowing what I was talking about, but I was at least had a soft spot in my heart. Even though if you would have seen me right then and there, you would have said, this dude's hard to the things of God. But I had three friends in front of me and some college kids were out there and they were trying to hand out some religious tracts, okay? And my, fr my, my three friends in front of me, it was like we were walking in single file, like some little ducks walking down the road. And the first one said, I don't want that. Second was like, man, get that out of my face. The third one said, man, I don't want that. And I said, man, I'll take it. And I remember I stuck it in my pocket, okay? And, and the next morning, I can remember I woke up and I read that track, look, and I'm talking about, it was a picture of Jesus and he had blood streaming down his face and it said, all this I did for thee. And it talked about the cross and it talked about what he had done to pay the penalty for my sin. And I can just remember sitting on my bed and just crying and crying and tears because I knew that I was a sinner and I knew, and the, and the Holy Spirit, it's called conviction. The Holy Spirit started to convict me and show me that I wasn't right with God. Now, I can't tell you that I jumped up and got saved right in that moment and started living for the Lord. It didn't happen that way. But along the way of life, many times there's seeds that are planted. Why did I say that? Because God has always had a witness in the land. I'm talking about even in the ancient times, a mouthpiece that would speak the truth of God because God has always revealed himself to humanity. And that's the whole point in how he created Israel as a people to be his people and that through them he ended up giving us Jesus who 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 we call Messiah which means the anointed one and and ultimately Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins. So when we look back at Old Testament Israel, that's the relevance that we have in a sense there are brothers, there are kinsmen because there's people that have gone before us. And throughout the ages, there's people that have served God. And then you got the other group of people and they're not 
serving God. So let us not be confused whenever, and I don't mean this to be mean, I'm just trying to say it like it is, that there's people who will serve God and there's people that aren't going to serve God. And the people that don't serve God are the people of the world. And that's why God doesn't want his people living like the people in the world. And that's why God doesn't want the church be like inviting the world to come in. And that's why much of the, the problem with the modern church is that we have, uh, for the sense of being cool or relevant to the external world, we want to try to make things look different. We want to make it comfortable. I can remember one time I was talking to a youth pastor, my, my daughter, Bella. She said, Dad, I'm kind of getting uncut because, you know, I've been talking about things happening in the church for a long time. And I can remember we were going to church and she said, you know, Dad, I haven't been real comfortable in youth group lately. I kind of feel like it's kind of like a club. Now, I'm not sure what Bella's motives were. (laughs) I'm thinking that maybe she was getting tired of going to youth group, or I don't know what her story was. But I said, oh, really? Okay. And you know me. I told you all I got some control issues. But I was on the elder board, so I felt like I had a right. Okay, so I go up in there, and I'm telling you, dude, it was like a club. Now, I've been to clubs. I'm not fussing about people that go to clubs. People that go to clubs, they go to clubs. But you're not supposed to bring the club up in the church. That's what I'm trying to say. God's people are supposed to look different than the world because if we look just like the world, nobody knows the difference, right? If we're walking in darkness and everything's a gray area, then nobody knows the truth, right? And I can remember telling that guy, I said, look, bro, you're not going to like what I'm about to say. Just brace yourself because I'm about to say something you're really not going to like. I said, you're preparing these kids to be comfortable in a club more than you're preparing them to be comfortable in the church. And look, that was the beginning of a, it went south, but it is what it is. Okay. And what I'm saying is they had the lights dim. They had this beat, boom, 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 boom. They had these little, you know, fluorescent light things going on. And, you know, and the kids are sitting there already before the thing. And I was like, dude, next thing you know, y'all going to start stamping people's hands to get up in here. Oh, man, that's cool, dude. Stamp their hand and stick it under. And and I heard later after I left that they did that. And it's just like it's ridiculous. So anyway, I'm trying to make a point. They don't want you to understand why we talk about the Old Testament because we find within the Old Testament God's people. And what we find is, is that in the Old Testament, we find types of what God would do in the future when he would give us Jesus, okay? And so when we got into First Chronicles, what we talked about last week was that King Saul was a type of the flesh. Now, what does the flesh mean? The flesh describes when I do what I want to do as opposed to doing what God wants to do. If you remember the story when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, which is right before he's about to get arrested and right before he dies on the cross the day, the day before, he says, Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. But then he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. In your life and in my life, in this journey of Christianity, there's always going to be situations and opportunities. Every day we're going to wake up and there's going to be a a trial or a test that could be placed before us. Will we walk in the flesh what I want or will we walk in the spirit? Listen, walking in the flesh versus the spirit can be in so many different ways. It can be in the music that you choose to listen to. It can be in the church that you choose to go to. It can be the way that you choose to correct your children. It can be the, your your what you desire for entertainment. It can be in the mate that you choose, that you decide to marry, right? I'm just saying. It can be so many different things things because look when I want what I want then sometimes I'm just going to go on out there and I'm gonna get it and and look oh no this is God's will but look God wants to speak to us and if you go and you go and you grab it and you're not praying from your heart nevertheless not my will but your will be done Houston we got a problem because it might look good on honeymoon night for a little minute but look it's it's about to get ugly quick if you stepped out in the flesh and you're not willing to try to go through the battle and trust God in the spirit you'll be quitting on everything because ain't nothing gonna go your way is that okay if I tell you the truth John 16 and 33 the Lord said this in this world you will have tribulation you know what the word tribulation means? It means to be pressed. It means to be, pr- the word, it means to be pressed. 
And, and so whenever you feel the pressures of life because the boss is not acting right, the, you know, the, the husband, not the wife, the, the husband is not acting right or, or whatever is not going your way and you begin to feel the pressures of life bearing down on you. We should not be confused about that. We should expect that because our, our Lord said, this is what Jesus said. Don't try to switch it. Don't try to pull a switch and bait. Look, the, the word of faith people try to tell you that they ain't never nothing bad going to happen to you because all you got to do is confess the right thing all the time. Hold on. Hold on. Jesus said, this is his words, the words of the, of the eternal King of kings and Lord of lords. In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. I got good news for you, Christian. Hallelujah. The Jesus that you serve, the Jesus that you give your heart to, even though you're being pressed, even though you feel the weight on your back, he will give you the grace that you need to make it through, to make it through, the, to, to, to trust God and to live for God. Amen. And so it, so Saul was a type of the flesh and David was a type of the spirit. Now, along the way in the lineage, I pointed out to y'all and I had this beautiful little PowerPoint thing I was going to show y'all and y'all were going to be able to see with your eyes. And I thought it was going to help you learn. But nevertheless, here we are. I tried to break down the lineage. And what I did was I tried to tell you that the, the main focus, focal point of the genealogy that Ezra was showing us had to do with two main tribes, the tribes of Israel. You remember Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, had 12 sons. The 12 sons became the 12 tribes. Two tribes of significance for the nation of Israel was the tribe of Levi and the tribe of Judah. From Levi came the priests, from Judah came the kings. Okay, And so that was the emphasis point. But then he switches into the Saul as king, which was the flesh, 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 flesh. Our own desires and our own will. Well, along that way, when we got to the priests, I mentioned a man named Melchizedek. Do y'all remember that? I mentioned this man named Melchizedek. Now, this is a strange name. I get it. And I wrote his name up on the board, and we broke it down, and we talked about what it meant. And uh, as a matter of fact, I think I'll do that again because I was going to draw you like a little timeline. And so I just want to remind you, so this is his name, Melchizedek, okay? And if you'll remember, I said... Uh, it, that it was a compound word made up of two words. And just to go ahead, just to make it, you know, make you aware again, this first part of the word means king. And this word, just for, for brevity, I'll put this, this word here, Zedek, means righteousness. Okay, so we'll just say right. And he was the king of Salem. Y'all remember that? I told you that. And, and Salem was what? Was ancient Jerusalem, right? And, ancient, and so what does the word Jerusalem mean? The, it means peace. So the word Jerusalem means peace. So, and then, and then when we're going to read some of this tonight, it actually says that he was priest of God most high. So he was also a priest. Now, listen, what I need you to understand is, is that I'm going to try to hold my shirt down because I don't want y'all to see my skin. But this is like B.C. 2000. OK, this is somewhere around B.C. 2000 right here. OK. And so but look, we're also going to find a spot where Melchizedek is mentioned in the Bible at one 1000 BC, and then we're going to find another spot where he's mentioned approximately, you know, somewhere maybe around 68 AD. And when we get to that, we'll talk about it. So in this one here, David talks about it. King David talks about it in a psalm. And, and these are the only three places. And over here, this is in the book of Hebrews, which is in the New Testament. All right, these are the only three places that the name Melchizedek is mentioned in the entirety of the Bible. All right, and so again, though, I want you to see this. In B.C. 2000, the king of righteousness, the king of peace, and priest of God most high. He's a mysterious character. He shows up out of nowhere, okay? And um, I know that I had asked her to get, the, uh, get that Hebrews passage queued up, but you just hold off a second. Let's just talk. 
Let's, let's talk about this. I'm just going to talk to you about the story a little bit. If you're taking notes, you can go back and you can look at Genesis chapter 14. And it's somewhere around verse 7. But we're not going to read a whole bunch of it right now. I'm just going to go ahead and talk to you a little bit about the story. Because I think I'm really going to preach the Genesis 14 part of it on Sunday. Okay, But, but I want you to know this. I want you to know that something happened. Something happened in the life of Abraham. Now, Abraham is a big part of this story. Abraham is a direct connect to Melchizedek. Now, what you got to understand about Abraham is, is that he is considered in the Bible, in the New Testament, as the father of the faith. Okay, Abraham comes at a time before there ever was a nation called Israel. Because you got to understand, Abraham had a son named, named Isaac, Isaac had a son, well, he, they each had two sons, but I'm sticking to the lineage. A- Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob, and Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So, so in Israel, be- and later on, it became the nation after the exodus from Egypt and all of that. And so what I need you to understand, though, is that when we're talking about Abraham, this is before the law. God gave promises to Abraham before the nation of Israel was ever in existence, before the law was ever in existence, because the Bible teaches us in the book of Galatians that God, foreknowing that he would justify the Gentiles by faith, who's the Gentiles? All the nations that are not Israel. Sometimes the Bible calls them heathen. Why would the Bible call Gentile people heathen? Because they didn't know the true God of the universe. They were worshiping false gods, right? They were worshiping false gods. Just like in my own way, by default, I was worshiping false gods back when I was in the world. You don't have to like it. I didn't come over here to poke nobody in the eyeball. I'm talking about myself right now. When I was over there singing ACDC and saying I'm on a highway to hell and my friends are going to be there too, I was worshiping false gods. I was, demon spirits are behind that stuff. You think that's the Lord telling you to want, oh yeah, dude, go have like a bong party down there, man. It's going to be, no, there ain't going to be no parties in hell. Jesus preached on hell. He said, a place where the fire isn't quenched, the worm doesn't die, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is not a place we want to go. Amen? And so we, we, we don't, we're not actively, although I had some friends in Lafayette that were actively worshiping weird stuff, but for the most part, most of us, we're not all out there looking to worship devils, right? But, we, but whenever we're not serving the Lord, these spirits are grabbing a hold of us And we don't even realize it, but they're like idols in our life. And there's demonic strongholds that begin to to grab a hold of us. And we're not free to serve the Lord because we get keep getting drawn back, keep getting drawn back. But look, the Lord wants to set us free. All right, So, so Abraham is a father of the faith, the father of the faith. Because again, the Bible teaches us that Abraham believed God. And it was counted unto him as righteousness. That's in Romans chapter 4. Okay, so, so in other words, Abraham didn't do. No, he did do, but that's not what made him righteous. Correct? He believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And so what did he believe God for? Well, there's a lot that he believed God for, and we don't really have time to get into it. But I'll tell you one thing he believed God for, and I love this story, and y'all probably hear me talk about it at least once a month. Genesis 22, he believed God when God said that he was going to have to bring his son up, his supernatural son, and offer him up as a sacrifice in Genesis chapter 22. The Bible says he laid wood on the lad's back, and the lad carried the wood up the hill, and he said, Father, I see the fire. I see, I see the, you know, the, the, the knife or whatever he said, but he said, where, I see the wood, and I see the fire, but where's the sacrifice? And God said, he, Abraham said, he will provide a sacrifice. And that day, the Lord provided a ram in the thicket. So what God provided was a sacrifice, amen? God provided a sacrifice for you and I, a supernatural son that walked up a hill, 
and carried wood on his back. His name was Jesus. See, Father Abraham didn't have to offer up his supernatural son because our Father in heaven offered up his supernatural son, born of a virgin, born of the Spirit of God, and hallelujah. Now listen, you can't get any better than that. 2,000 years before Jesus would ever walk on the face of the earth, God was already playing this out in Old Testament passages, allowing this to be played out in real life. So Abraham is the father of the faith. God foreseeing that he would justify the Gentiles by faith, he preached the gospel in advance to Abraham. And so in the story of Melchizedek, this is the story, Lot, his nephew, finds himself in the midst of trouble. And Abraham goes to save him. And there's a war that takes place, and Abraham wins the battle. This is the fast version. And whenever Abraham, after Abraham wins the battle, we're not going to talk about the other king. We'll talk about him Sunday. But two kings go out on the battlefield to meet him. And guess what? One of the kings is Melchizedek. Melchizedek, king of righteousness, king of of peace, uh, uh, priest of God most high. He goes out there and he meets Abraham and, 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 he, and he offers unto Abraham. And you know what Abraham turns around and does is Abraham turns around and he pays tithes to Melchizedek. Abraham pays tithes to Melchizedek. And the Bible makes a big deal about making sure that we understand. Okay, it says it actually. Why don't you go ahead and turn there for me, uh, Haley. Genesis chapter uh, 14, and I believe it's uh, 19. I'm going to go ahead and double check in my Bible over here. Yes. Let's see here. Can you, can you move to the, let's go ahead and read it. He says, and, and he blessed him and said, this is Melchizedek talking to Abraham, okay? He blessed him and he said, blessed be Abram of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. Okay, next, next verse. And blessed be the most high God, which has delivered your enemies into your hand. Now I want you to see this right here. And he gave him tithes of all. Tithes. The ESV version says a tenth because that's what a tithe means. A tithe is a tenth. If you walked in here the night and you thought, oh, the preacher's preaching on money, that's not really what I'm preaching on. People that have been coming to this church for any length of time know that I never even hardly ever talk about money. Okay, but guess what? My bad, (laughs) because we're supposed to talk about the whole of the scripture, and you need to understand a little bit something about what's going on. So it says, Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Well, what was there to give? You got to understand, when Abraham won this battle, there's something called spoil, the spoil of the war, the goods that are left over, the gold, the chalices, the gems, the things that, that the other army had, all the weaponry, all of them, if they had horses, anything that they had that that other army lost now belongs to Abraham, okay? But guess what it says? He gave a tenth to Melchizedek because, see, Abraham recognized the spiritual leadership of this priest that came out of nowhere, just showed up, all right? And you'll be able to see it a little bit better if I end up preaching the other aspect of this story on Sunday. If not, then the Lord will have something better for you. But what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that Melchizedek blessed Abraham. He, he said, and blessed be the most high God which has delivered your enemies. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little bit of a secret. The other king was, was showing you the opposite side. The other king was showing you the world. He was offering what the world offers. He was offering what the spirit of the world offers. And it was real clear to Abraham what was going on. And Abraham knew because he had already heard the voice of God. And Abraham says, no, you're of the Lord. And he gives him a tenth of all the spoil. Abraham recognizes that Melchizedek has spiritual authority and pays the first tithe to this king. The first tithe that is ever mentioned in the Bible is paid by Abraham to this king, this priest named Melchizedek. Now, I want you to understand something. I want to I want to I want to kind of like ease the air, all right? When I first got saved, I went to a church where they preached a lot about tithing. And I was taught, it's just what you do. 
you pay your tithes. Now, I paid my tithes, but I got to be honest with you. I wasn't happy about it. Is it okay if I'm just honest with you? Look, I'm telling you right now, boy, you had to like almost like, it, it wasn't really quite like that, but I felt spiritually. It was almost like they, they was having to pry my hand open to get that money out of my hand. Because look, man, I'm working for this money. This is my money. See, that was the mindset that I had. I was like, man, I'm earning this money. This money is mine. And, and, and look, it wasn't for many, many years until the Lord freed me. I, I like to use myself as an example so that y'all don't feel weird and condemned whenever I'm talking to you about stuff. Because I want you to know that this is a common thing that a lot of people struggle with. Okay? Okay. But, but so, I mean, I was just, I, would, I never felt good about giving the money. But I would do it because I was told that's what we were supposed to do. All right. Well, so for me, what happened was when I really became grateful to the Lord and started being happy to give him my tithe was after my sister died. And I've told you all that story, my middle sister, when she took her life. And it was very, very tragic and it was very, very painful. And in the midst of that pain, God showed up and he ministered to my heart and he began to show me my ways. He began to show me myself. And it wasn't pretty. This is after 12 years of Christianity, my friend. It wasn't pretty. And the Lord began to show me, I'm going to teach you some things. And I'm going to show you some things. And along the way of him teaching and showing me some things and ministering to my heart and healing me and restoring me. Next thing you know, man, I had some pep in my step. And I mean, I'm not going to tell you that I was skipping up to the altar to throw my money in there. But that's what I felt like in my heart. I felt like, man, let's do a dance and let's give unto the Lord. Why? Because I, the truth became in my heart. You cannot outgive God. When you start to read the word of God and you start to believe the word of God, you cannot outgive the Lord. Now, I've told y'all this story about me on more than one occasion, but let me just, I said it probably last week, because I cannot get over where I was and where I am. I can't get past it. Like it keeps, I can't get over the fact of what I used to know about the Bible and what I know about the Bible now and realize that I still got so much more to learn. But when I think back about, and I, look, when I think back to that guy that was 19 years old, 18 years old, and sitting on that air conditioner, I, I, it doesn't mean much to y'all because y'all never saw me. Sitting on that air conditioner at that convenience store called Triple Quick on Johnson Street in Lafayette, Louisiana, waiting for the next dude to come by, and hopefully he's he going to he gonna have a little something to get my head right or whatever. And my dad coming down from Houston, and he's like, boy, he's at the house. He's like, what is wrong with you, boy? Pull yourself up by the bootstrap sitting on that air conditioner. And, man, you so embarrassing. You know, I mean, he saw me. And you know, I had this long hair. I'm like, hey, yeah, you know, that was just, just a... Lord, help me, man. I was a bum. I was a bi. I was, a, it was in bondage to the works of Satan. And I was just like, my whole life was just falling apart. And then one touch of the master's hand, man, and like the next thing you know, you know, it's like, now, I mean, I got a master's degree in nursing. I got a master's degree in theology. How did this even happen? Amen. Not everybody goes to college, but how did this happen? God happened. God showed up and he turned it around. And that's what he'll do. Look, we don't all need to be nurse practitioners. Look, you might be the best carpenter in the house. You might be the best welder in the house. You might be the best engineer. I don't know what God's going to do, but I'm going to tell you, if he puts his spirit of excellence on the inside of you, whatever it is that you do, you're going to be the best at it, my friend. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I need you to understand something about the tithe because I feel like God showed me something about the tithe that I don't know that I ever really completely understood, even though maybe it was already happening in my heart. So I wrote it down right here. You ready? The tithe is not about making a preacher rich. And I'll remind you, look, I feel like I have every right to be, have a double honor because I'm a preacher of the word. The apostle Paul said that, that ministers of the word have a right to a double honor because some people are like, well, preacher, you got way too many jobs for you to get a check from the church. I don't take a check from the church. I haven't taken a check from the church in eight years. I got every right to take a check from the church, though. I'm just going to make sure y'all understand that. And when I'm ready to start taking a check from the church, I'll let you know I'm taking a check now. I'm not, okay, but, but as of right now, the Lord says, no, you can't outgive me, Matt. Remember what I told you? Keep on giving. Give your time. Give your money. Give your service. Give to me because I gave to you. Hallelujah. And the more I give to him, the more he gives back. 
Amen. And I've, I've seen it. I've seen it. And, you know, and I've had people before that I've trained as nurse practitioners. I went to a football game one time, a uh, Saints game, when the Saints beat the Minnesota Vikings and Brett Favre, you know, and they made it to the Super Bowl. And I told my buddy, I'm like, look, dude, I got to go to this game because his daddy owned a company and they had like a little booth. I, like what, 400? I'll pay $400 for this ticket. This is a once in a lifetime chance. And, dude, I was there. I saw it. I saw them put a hurt. I, look, as much as I love Brett Favre. Oh, anyway, let me not get into that. That's I get into the flesh. But the point is, is that after they dropped me off that night, the guy's brother was a nurse practitioner guy that I had trained. And later on, the guy that I was friends with that I was going to church with, he said, my brother wanted to know what you do with all your money because of the house you live in. So this is the thing. In his mind, he's like, Boy, this Christianity thing ain't working. But the reality of it is, is that anything of the way that my house looked, I need to let y'all know, is not the Lord's fault. It's because I wasn't doing what was right with the 90% that the Lord was letting me keep, as opposed to the 10, it wasn't the 10% that I was giving to the Lord that was the problem. I just want to make that clear. So in the eyes of logic and in the eyes of the world, it doesn't make any sense to give the money that you have to the kingdom of God. But I'm here to tell you from the spiritual eyes of understanding of God, it doesn't make any sense not to give unto the Lord that gave everything for you. And so this is what I wrote down. The tithe is not about making a preacher rich. The tithe is not about us attempting to hit a spiritual lotto. Because I'm just going to be honest with you, I've seen a lot of preachers on television talk about if you sow your $1,000 seed, you're going to get a $100,000 reward or whatever the case. If your motives are to give in order to automatically receive, yes, the word of God says that you can't outgive God, but if you're looking to receive a financial blessing, you're basically playing the numbers, my friend. That is not the Lord's will. The Lord's will is for you to give out of a giving heart because he's already given unto you. If you're giving in the mo and the motives are to receive a financial blessing back, then you've already missed the boat. Okay, so the tithe is not about making a preacher rich. The tithe is not about us attempting to hit a spiritual lotto. The tithe is the believer recognizing God's sovereignty and authority over his life. The tithe is recognition that without God, he wouldn't have anything right now. As a matter of fact, without God, right? Oh, but what about the doctor that he's a neurologist and he drives a Mercedes AMG and he ain't got nothing to do with God? Yeah? Well, guess what? If he don't turn his heart to the Lord, according to the Bible I read, he will not bring his Mercedes AMG with him to heaven. And instead, he will burn in a devil's hell because he rejected the Christ that God sent for him to die for his sins. I don't want anybody to die and go to hell. I'm trying to make a point. The tithe is not about these things. The tithe is recognition that I wouldn't have anything. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't have anything without God right now. Abraham would be dead right then and there. You understand? 318 servants that fought a huge army. Abraham would be dead or both he and his nephew Lot would be tied up and being pulled behind a horse, probably with a hook through their nose, because that's what they would do. They would just hook them. That's what they did to the last king, the last king of Israel when they brought him to Babylon. They stuck a hook in his nose, just like they do to a bull. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine how bad that would hurt? Put one of them little nose rings in there, and tie it, and kind of drag that behind a horse. Ooh, that wouldn't be nothing nice right there. Right, But that's what they would be. They'd be being pulled with a hook behind their nose as they were being led to a desert, through the desert to a foreign land. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That's what the tithe is. The tithe is recognizing the sovereignty of God. The tithe is recognizing the authority of God and me understanding that without God, I would have nothing. I believe that because I know where he's brought me. You see, some people would say, yeah, but other people have gained notoriety, notoriety and status. And even people sometimes will say, I'll tell them, I'll try to use my testimony with people in the clinic 
at the hospital. I'll tell the people I work with. It doesn't matter who you are. I'm going to tell. I'll, if I get an opportunity, I'm going to tell you. And it never fails. What they want to say is, yeah, but look at you now. Look what you've done. I'm like, no, time out, boss. You don't understand. It wasn't me. I didn't do anything. I was sitting on an air conditioner. I'll tell them. Outside of a convenience store without a dime in my pocket waiting for somebody to come get me high. God, I didn't do any of this. God did it. God showed up and he changed me. And now I want my life to give him glory. Amen. I want my life to bring him glory. And now look, last week, dude, I can't get off of this story, man. It's just rolling through my mind about Jonathan. You remember that? Jonathan was King Saul's son. He was the next in line to be the king. And I remember how I told y'all I had never seen that before. And young David, when he killed Goliath, y'all remember that? 1 Samuel chapter 17, towards the end. Young David has, I never saw that before. He had the, he had the head of the giant in his hand while he was talking to King Saul. And the Bible says that Jonathan, Saul's son, who was next in line to be king, as soon as David was done talking, his heart was connected to David. Okay, and then a two couple of verses later, the Bible says he stripped himself. If you read the ESV version, it says he stripped himself of his robe and he gave it to David. Now, we, I talked about this to you. To make the point that, listen, we know that kings wear robes. The kings wear garments and princes wear garments to show that they are royalty, to set them apart. Basically, what he did was he stripped himself of everything that was who he was, and he gave it to the king. I'm trying to get that point across to you. So I wrote this. No better yet than the last story I told you. Tithing is like Jonathan standing behind his father, King Saul, while staring at the shepherd boy who has a fist full of the giant's hair. The head of Goliath is dangling. The blood is puddling on the dusty ground below. And, he, and David is telling the story of victory. And as those words of the anointed king, the true king, enter his ears, that spirit of victory enters his heart and he's immediately knitted to the king. And two verses later, he strips himself of what was previously everything that was who he was. You understand that? His title, his life, his future, his whole identity was wrapped up in this garment that he was wearing. He strips himself of it, he takes it off, and he gives it to the true king, his new king, that his heart now is connected to, amen? And that is the spiritual concept that the Lord is showing me of the tithe. The realization that all that I am, all that I have belongs to him. Yet, all that he asks of me is a tenth. How easy that should be for me to recognize, right? His sovereignty in my life and just to simply release what belongs to him back to him. Jesus gave his life for us and the way I used to be, I couldn't even release the tenth. Like, and, and listen, I'm not, I don't want y'all to feel weird or condemned. That's not what I'm here to do. Let the Lord lead you and guide you and for this truth to become part of who you are. I'm not a money preacher, but, but look, it, you, it, I don't, it, it's up to you where you put your money. I'm not even saying that, that you have to put your money in this basket. But if you come to this church, then that's really what the word of God talks about. But, but nevertheless, I'm trying to make a point to acknowledge God and what he's done in our hearts and in our lives, amen, and it's just one way for us to be able to show our devotion and our recognition. It's like, a, it's like an act of faith. When, when you go and you come to church, are you having faith that God's gonna do something in your life? When you, when you lift your hands in worship, are you having faith that there's a God on the other side that's receiving your worship? Amen. When you pray, are you having faith that there's a God on the other side that hears and answers prayer? Amen. And so when you give your tithe, you're recognizing and you're acknowledging that there is an authority that is higher than you. And his word says it. And so you're willingly and, 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 and happily giving back because you know that he's already giving you everything. Amen. The tithe is one form of recognition by the believer towards God that God gives him the victory, that God is his provider, that God is who he is in covenant with. 
I don't want your money, devil. We'll talk about that Sunday. I don't want to have what you offer. Instead, I want to take a portion of what I have and give it to God in acknowledgement to the fact that if I didn't have God, I wouldn't have anything. Oh, but preacher, I had this money before I met you or God. Yeah, but did you have righteousness? Did you have peace? No, because you can't have righteousness or peace without the king of righteousness or without the king of peace, without the priest of God most high. And then just as fast as Melchizedek showed up on the scene, he, 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 it just as fast as he came, he mysteriously disappeared. And he's not mentioned again until King David writes a song and mentions him by name. Can you go to Psalm 110 and you can go to verse 1? So this may not mean a whole lot to you, but again, look, 2000 B.C., it's a thousand years later that King David writes a psalm. Now, King David, look, you got to understand the Israelites studied the Old Testament scriptures. David wrote songs to the Lord. David was familiar with this story. But look, what we're about to read is a prophecy. You understand this? Look, you, you ever heard of a prophetic anointing? <laughs> look, the, God speaks through the pr mouths of prophets. Many times the, what a prophet speaks he, there's a foretelling, but there can be a forth telling. What, what are you trying to say? A prophet sometimes will forth tell. Israel, the Lord says such unto you. If you do not turn from your wickedness and you do not turn away from your idols and the things that you're serving, you will find yourself in Babylonian captivity. You will find yourself prisoner to, to the king of another nation. Okay, that's a forth telling and a foretelling. Turn from your wicked ways or else such and such is going to happen, right? David right here becomes a prophet of God. He writes something down on this page and he says, Lord, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Do you, do you realize that the whole world is against your God? I want you to understand that. The whole world is against your God. The nations are against your God. The, the spirit of Antichrist is against your God. But one day, God, God's in the process of bringing it back. Amen? So that's what this is talking about. He, and it's specifically talking about before Jesus. Now look, thousand years after Melchizedek is David, and a thousand years after David really is the time frame of Jesus. Okay? And he says, the Lord, David's saying, the Lord said unto my Lord. In other words, the God the Father said to Jesus the Son. You, we can say that. That, that you sit at my right hand, the right hand is the side of power. Sit at my right hand until the day that I make your enemies your footstool. Next verse. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of your enemies. You know what this is talking about? This is talking about the end, my friend. And I don't know if you can read the room or not, spiritually speaking, but something is happening upon this earth. Things are changing very rapidly. Listen, there, there's a, the spiritual climate is becoming very obvious. Since 9-11, since COVID, and we all know, ain't, nobody's ignorant to it anymore, something weird is happening spiritually in the atmosphere. Most people that don't even serve God already know that there's all kind of weird trickery and weird stuff going on. We don't even have time to get into all that right now. We already talk about it all the time. But look, one day the Lord is going to bring it to an end. You got to understand that judgment is coming. Grace is going to run out. Judgment's coming. And the Lord is going to get his retribution. And that's what that's talking about. Next verse. He says, your people shall be willing in the day of your power and the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. Next verse. The Lord has sworn. This is the prophecy right here. You ready for this? This is, look, the Lord has sworn. And if you look it up in the Hebrew text, the word is oath because it talks about it in Hebrews. It uses the word oath. The Lord has sworn. The Lord has made an oath and he will not repent. The word repent means to change the mind. The Lord has made an oath and he will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So we have this mysterious character that shows up in Genesis 14. He meets Abraham on the battlefield. Abraham pays him the first tithe, and then we don't hear anything, and then he disappears. 
And then we don't hear anything about him again until a thousand years later when the psalmist David writes about him right here and he prophetically tells us that God has made an oath that Melchizedek, will, that, that the Lord will be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, why is that necessary, Christian? Because look, you gotta understand something. Jesus was not functioning as a priest in his first, the first time he came to earth. Jesus was the king, you understand? Jesus was a king, Jesus was a prophet, Jesus was a worker of miracles, Jesus was a sacrifice. Jesus was so many things that I probably can't list them, but he did not function in the role of priest. I'm not saying he didn't minister. He ministered left and right. He, he, like, he meant, and that's what priests do. They minister. So I'm not trying to say that Jesus didn't function in ministry to minister to people. I'm trying to say the office of a priest, and I'm going to prove it to you through the word of God. I'm not making, I didn't eat pizza last night. I, I'm going to prove it to you through the word of God, that, that this is what the Lord, the word of God is teaching us that that Jesus did not function in his first advent as a priest and look because you understand the order of the priest comes from the tribe of Levi and from the Le from the offsprings of Levi there was a man named Aaron y'all remember that okay Aaron was Moses's brother through the lineage of Aaron came the high priests but the, but the problem is, is that the high priests themselves were born of Adam and they were born in sin. That's why in the Old Testament on the Day of Atonement, they had to first bring an animal's blood in to forgive their own sins before they could offer up a sacrifice for the sins of the people. We'll just hold your thought there. So that wasn't good enough for the eternal high priest. He come, So God, now listen, let me just tell you this. We're going to look at some other scriptures before we close this out. And the idea of the Bible is it's definitely trying to tell us something about Melchizedek. It tells us later on in the book of Hebrews, we don't know where he came from. The, the writer to the, in the Hebrews says, we don't know where he comes from. There's no genealogy. He doesn't have a mama. He doesn't have his daddy, or at least what we know of. So he's like an eternal order. He's an eternal priest. Just like Jesus is an eternal priest. Now, there's a lot of different divisions of scholars and commentators. Oh, okay, well then what was he? Okay. And it's not to say that he definitely wasn't a real person. He could have very well been a real person. We just don't know. And you can try to dig it out because believe me, I've spent hours on this. And you can try to figure it all out all you want to. Uh, but, but listen, in the end, you ain't, you're not going to know. You're not going to know whether or not he was a real human being, a king of Salem, or whether or not he was a Christophany. What? The physical presentation of Jesus Christ on the earth in human form happened on more than one occasion in the Old Testament. Okay, so you're not going to know. And guess what? You don't need to know because the Bible didn't tell us. I'm just trying to explain to you that the Bible with this Melchizedek has a purpose for us not knowing for sure what the story is with all that. Okay, now if you could go to Hebrews chapter six, and we're just gonna kind of start reading, and we're gonna break it down from there, all right? Hebrews chapter six, verse 19. It's in, that's in the, uh, all right. It says, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters into that, within the veil. You know, you know why people give up on reading the Bible? Because of stuff like this. Because look, if you don't know the Bible, it's like, what did he just say? Like, I just read this and I don't understand it. Can I just encourage you with something? Just keep coming. Just keep coming back. Just keep sitting back and learning and listening. Because look, in a year from now, Two years from now, if you, if you endure, you're going to know so much more about the Bible than what you ever thought that you could have known. All right? Now, I'm going to go ahead and take the time each time I preach to break stuff down. and Because I refuse to color in crayon like that dude told me I needed to do. You didn't need to color it in crayon, dude, because I'm at a third grade level, bro. And no, we're not right here for third grade Christianity. We want our master's degree. I mean that illustratively. We want to understand the word of God. God, amen, because it's upon the word of God that we will build our house upon the rock and the winds will blow and the storms may come.
come, but the man that builds his house on the rock, his house will not be destroyed in the midst of the storm. What are you talking about? You talking about Hurricane Ida? No, I'm talking about the storms of life. I'm talking about when the relationship goes south. I'm talking about when the car breaks down. I'm talking about when you get sick in your body. I'm talking about when something happens to your child. I'm talking about when bad stuff starts happening. In this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. That's what I'm trying to talk about. Hallelujah. So we have to understand the word of God. All right. So look, when he says we have an anchor for our soul, you know what an anchor does? What does an anchor do? It holds the boat in place. And he said, look, we have an anchor that's sure and steadfast. That means that the rope ain't going to pop, my friend. It takes a lot of power to pop a nylon rope on the boat out in the Gulf. But look, I done seen it happen. And don't be standing on the deck when it does. This rope ain't going to break. This chain ain't going to break. This anchor's steadfast and sure. And look what it did. It entered That anchor is Jesus, by the way. It entered into the veil. Well, what does that mean? The veil is the place that separated the holy of holies where the Ark of the Covenant was, where the presence of God was. And now we're being told, listen, Jesus entered in to the holy of holies. Hallelujah. And he is the fulfillment of all that has gone before. And now you and I are connected through the anchor for our soul. You can trust in this, my friend. Next verse, where the forerunner is for us entered in. Even Jesus made a high priest forever after the order, 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 the order. Amen. All right, let's keep reading. Next verse. This whole next chapter in chapter 7 is talking about Melchizedek. So we're just going to go through it and we're going to read. For this Melchizedek, you already know this, he was the king of Salem. He was the priest of God most high. He, he met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and he blessed him. Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Next verse. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, Melchizedek, that's his name. And after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Next verse. Without father, look at this, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the son of God, abides a priest continually. All right, so just before you go to the next verse, let's just think about this. What the Bible is telling us, some people will say, well, there you go. It was, it was Jesus in the flesh. And I'm not here to argue that point because that's what I personally believe, but I can't prove it. And when I get to a spot in the Bible that I cannot absolutely definitively prove, what I do is I tell you that. And, and, and you can't prove it either. You can, your opinion can say that's what it's saying, but it could be saying we just don't have a record of it. It could be saying that, but we purposely don't have a record of it because God didn't want us to know because he was a type of Christ and Jesus had no beginning. Contrary to what the Jehovah's Witnesses will try to convince you of, Jesus is not the incarnation of the Archangel Michael. Contrary to what the Jehovah's Witnesses will try to tell you, Jesus is not a creation. Jesus is the eternal word that spoke the worlds into existence. He had no beginning. He has a father. His father is God. Hallelujah. And yes, he became flesh, but Jesus was before his incarnation was the eternal word of God, the eternal son, the eternal king. He always has been. He always will be. His origin point, if you want to say that he had one, was when he clothed himself in human flesh so that he changed to become a man so that he could pay the penalty for man's sin. But he was always, always there. Amen. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like to the Son of God, he abides a priest continually. The, the Jesus that we serve, he's our faithful high priest. Amen. Next verse. Now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. Next verse. 
And verily, and verily, they that are of the sons of Levi. Okay, so look, let's just go ahead and break it down. Y'all love the word of God? I hope you do. I know that, look, sometimes it, it, it's, it's arduous to go through it. But let's not, let's not grow weary in well-doing. Let's go ahead and break it down. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi. Who did I tell you the sons of Levi were? The priests, the Levitical priesthood, those that handled all the things in the tabernacle. You remember that tent before there was a temple? All the fire pans and the altars. And look, they had to pick all that stuff up and pack it up just like a camping trip. Because, you know, the tabernacle was a tent. And just like whenever you set up the tent, you got to tear it down, you got to move to the next location, that's what they were responsible for. They were responsible for tearing all that stuff down, packing it up, and they were responsible for ministering in the midst of all of that. That's who Levi was. Look, look, I'm not going to apologize for this. Levi was born way over here because Levi was one of, was one of Abraham's, what, grandchildren because it was Jacob's third-born son. But, but look, Abraham, but look, if Levi is Abraham's grandchild, then, then 400 years later is when Aaron is born. So you understand what I'm trying to tell you when we talk about lineage in the Bible and we talk about the people that have gone before us? That's why these things matter because we're learning about these people in the Bible that have specific and purposeful Places in the scripture that teach us things. So Aaron was 400 years and he was a descendant of Levi, but I mean, you can't even, I mean, I don't know, his great, 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 great grandson or something like that. All right, so look, the, they that are the sons of Levi who received the office of the priesthood have a commandment from God to take tithes of the people because God said once he gave the law, once Israel was a nation and he gave the law, the people were to pay their tithes to the Levitical priests. Why? So that they could take care of, can I just say it, the church. <laughs> Is it, am I allowed to say that? To take care of the church, to take care of the tabernacle, to take care of the needs. I've had people listen, and again, I didn't, look, I know I'm preaching on tithing, but if you, this is your first time here, you can ask anybody that you're sitting by that I hardly ever talk about money. But I've had people come to the church before, and they're like, well, I just don't believe in tithing. And I'm like, well, why don't you believe in tithing? Uh, well, because, because Jesus did away with the law. Well, the only problem with that is, is that tithing was before the law. So that doesn't work. And it's saying this right here. Okay, and so here we, here we see Levi who received, and, and then, I, then I would say this, who do you think is going to pay for the light bill? <laughs> who's going to pay for the property if we need a bigger building for the kids? Who's going who's gonna to do all of that? I mean, I pay my tithe by the grace of God. You know what I'm saying? I, I have, still have a job by the grace of God, and I pay my tithe. I don't take money from the church, but I do. I pay my tithe. It's about $1,000 a month. I don't mind telling you. It's about $1,000 a month for the last eight years. And before that, I've been paying tithes to other people's churches. Every month, by the grace of God, because I, I can pay tithes. About $1,000 a month, faithfully, comes off the top. Somewhere around there, okay? And, and that's what the Lord showed me, all right? And again, I'm not sitting here to make you feel weird. I'm just shooting straight with you. I'm being transparent. And you can't, and like, can I tell you, you cannot outgive God. Why don't you try? <laughs> Look, that's a good thing if you're willing to try. He said it in Malachi. He said, test me in this. See that if you bring your tithes and offering it to the storehouse, that I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you cannot even contain. Now, all them years whenever I was given grudgingly don't count. <laughs> okay, you got to get your heart right and give them to the Lord and then watch it flourish. Amen. And also learn to do what to do with the other 90% child of God, right? Look, the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law that is of their brethren. So all those other tribes, you're paying your, tri you're paying your tithes Judah, you're paying your tithes Simeon, you're paying your tithes Reuben, those are the 12 tribes. All these people got to pay their tithes and they got to give it unto the priest. And look, back then it was maybe some chicken eggs or it was a handful of wheat or it was uh, their first offspring of the lamb or whatever the case, but they were paying their tithes, all right? And, and, and this is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. What that means is, okay, that, that Levi 
was born of Abraham, but yet he's taking tithes from them. Look, as a matter of fact, go to the next verse. But he whose descent is not counted from, from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. So, and next verse, let's just go ahead. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. What is that trying to say? That's trying to say that when, when Abraham paid his tithes to Melchizedek, he recognized Melchizedek was higher in spiritual authority than what he was. He could sense it. Look, like he could sense. And, and listen, Melchizedek is a type of Jesus. So please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying, oh, I'm the called pastor of God and you need to come pay me your tithes. That's not, it goes in the bucket and they, they count it and it goes into the bank. That's not what I'm trying to say. Melchizedek is a type of Jesus. Without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. That means Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. You and I are blessed by Christ. We pay our tithes to him. When you pay your tithes to this church, listen, you got, we got to understand this. This is, not, this is not your money. This is the Lord's money. You may not like the way that sounds or the way that feels, but I'm telling you the truth. Based on the word of God, that 10% is not yours. And actually, there's scripture that says you're robbing from him if you don't give what is his. Now, again, you got to understand you're not giving it to me. Don't think that. I already told you I don't take it. Okay, you're not giving it to me. You're giving it to the Lord. And you're showing your, your willingness to understand that he is greater than you. Amen? So you don't sit here. I've had people before be like, well, if you, if you do this or this, I might be able to give a little bit more, dude. Bring that stuff somewhere else, man. We don't want that money. We don't want that money. If that's how you're going to be like, if you can't trust the leadership of the church where you are to do the right thing with the money that you give, uh, Houston, we got a problem. Go find another church and give to that church and give to that work. Amen. But I hope that you can find a church that you agree with and you can trust that they will take the funds to do the right thing. All right. Next verse. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. Talking about Melchizedek received it. He's, he's an eternal priest. The next, next verse. And as I may so, so say, Levi also, this is so good. This is so deep, man. This is the kind of stuff that if you don't study the Bible, if you don't do your Sunday school stuff, you won't catch it. And as I may so say, Levi also, who receives tithes. Again, this is talking about the tribe of Levi because, look, you got to understand, by the time Hebrews, is, you know, you understand we're reading Hebrews now. So this is 68 A.D., 1,000 years before David, 1,000 years before Levi. He's still calling them Levi because it's the descendants of Levi. And he's saying that as many as I, as I may so say, Levi also, who receives tithes, even still, not, not today, but when he wrote it, paid tithes in Abraham. Next verse. He says, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. In other words, what he's saying is, is that Levi, before he was even born, was already paying tithes. And he, the point that the writer of Hebrews is making is this, is that Jesus is, is the preeminent one. Jesus is, well, for lack of better words, numero uno. If you go back and you read the beginning, because look, you got to understand what's going on in the book of Hebrews. The Christians are being persecuted. They were originally Jews. Jews, they got saved. And now the whole world is turning on them. I've told y'all this before. Jewish fathers would have a fake funeral for their sons. When their son left the, the faith of the Jews and turned into Christians, they would have a mourning ceremony saying that their son had died. The, 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 the commerce people wouldn't buy from him anymore. They couldn't sell to him. The, the church was hurting in Jerusalem. That's why Paul, if you read the missionary journeys in the book of Acts, he was taking up an offering from all the churches because the church in Jerusalem was strong struggling. They were poor. They were downcast. See, you and I, I'm just going to be real with you. We're spoiled in America. We may not always be spoiled. Lord, help us. But I'm trying to say right now we are. Because just, look, you might, we might think we got it bad, but we really don't. They had it bad, 
okay? And yet, while he was in the loins of his father, when Melchizedek met him, Levi was already, and so what I was trying to say is this, is that those Hebrew Christians were being persecuted to the point where they didn't have anything, okay? And, and look, sometimes, you know, I don't know about you, but the first time somebody, like, made fun of my Christianity, dude, I was like, my little heart was broken, you know? Like, dude, you believe in that, you know? And it's like, oh, man, I was so wounded. And it's like, Lord, help us. We need to be able to be stronger in Christ. Amen? All right, next verse. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? And again, the writer to the Hebrews was trying to show that Jesus was the fulfillment and he was greater than all the things that had gone before. Because as these new Christians that used to be Jews were being persecuted, they were being tempted to go back to their previous religion. So how does that work for me, pastor or preacher or whatever you would, Matt? (laughs) How does that work for me? Well, when you gave your heart to Christ, what world did you come out of? See, they came out of a world of religion. But what world did you come out of? Okay, you, you go ahead and fill in your own blank. I've already told you my blank. I was that little dude sitting on that air conditioner. I ain't even like really wanting to go back to that, by the way. Okay, but nevertheless, what was your old life? Because you see, just as the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness were tempted to go back and they remembered the melons and the garlic and the leeks, and the onions. Okay, well, they want to make a gumbo. But look, they said, oh, well, let's go back to Egypt. That's the heart of the Christian many times whenever he gets saved and bad things start to happen. What is he, what is he tempted to do? He's tempted to go back to his old way of life. He's tempted to go back to the alcohol. He's tempted to go back to the drugs. He's tempted to go back to putting his arms around, you know, somebody to feel comfort from another human being. He's tempted to do whatever it is that he's tempted to do from whatever it was that he came out of. That's how it's relevant for you. They came out of religion. They're being tempted to go back to their old ways and to serve. Look, at this time, the Old Testament Judaism is no more. This is not of God anymore. You understand that. Hey, listen, this sounds harsh to some people that are all about bringing the Jews back to Israel, but can I tell you something? And listen, I don't have a problem. As long as the Jews that are going back to Israel are being preached the gospel and getting saved, the problem that I have is when people say, oh, the Jews are God's chosen people. They got a different way to get in. No, it doesn't work that way, my friend. They got to go through the, the, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And so listen, Judaism today... Uh, this is going to be harsh, man. I don't have time to break it down. It's no different than a pagan religion. They have rejected Jesus. Until they receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they are not the people of God anymore. One day they will be the people of God again, but it's going to be after they receive Christ. All right? And so it says, it says it right here. If there was perfection through the Levitical priesthood because under it the people received the law, then why was there a need for another priest to arise? Because, again, the writer to Hebrews is saying, look, Jesus is superior to the angels who gave us Old Testament passages. Jesus is superior to Aaron. That's why Melchizedek is in the place. Jesus is superior to the Old Testament tabernacle. Jesus is superior to Moses. And so he's breaking down their belief system that says that it would be okay to go backwards because this is just too hard. We don't really know what we're going to face when the future comes. I mean, I'm just saying, we don't, look, did you expect COVID? (laughs) Did you expect the world to change the way that it did that fast? I mean, do we really know what's, what's up ahead? No, we don't. We, never, we really don't. And so the question is, I'm just saying, have you noticed that it's becoming more, it's, it's becoming harder to be a, a, a Christian in today's society? I mean, and look, again, we're protected in America. Look, they got Christians in Syria that get burned. They're getting burned. They're dying. Okay. Um, and so for you and I, though, it is still, we can sense it. Can we not? That it's becoming, that, that the spirit of Antichrist, this stuff is real. And it's coming against the people of God. And it's just going to get worse should the Lord tarry. 
Come quickly, Lord Jesus, come. Amen? And so go to the next verse. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of a necessity a change also of the law. Next verse. For he whom these things are spoken pertains to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. So I want you to see that. And again, I really did have this broken down to where I think it would have been easier for you to be able to see it. But what, what this is talking about right here is this. For whom these things are spoken pertains to another tribe. Now he's talking about Jesus. He's saying all this stuff that we're talking about, all this connection to Melchizedek, all this is talking about Jesus. And he's saying whom, that's a personal pronoun, Jesus, that we're talking about. He came from another tribe, a tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. What is, what is the point that he's making? He's, the point he's making is people that came from the tribe of Judah did not give attendance at the altar. The, child, the people that came from the tribe of Levi gave attendance at the altar. Does that make sense? All right, go to the next verse. And he says, For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. Moses never said anything about a king serving as a priest. Okay? And, and, and this is the point. The Kings came from Judah. And so to make a long story short, but could you go to, to uh, Genesis chapter 49 for me? Um, because I want to show you a couple of little things real quick. And can you just scroll down? I believe it's probably going to be uh, verse maybe 14, I believe is what it is. Uh, no, that's not it. Go to the next one, maybe. Uh, can you scroll? Can you see ahead? Because I'm looking for the tribe of Judah. I can't remember the exact verse. Uh, keep, keep scrolling until you hit Judah. You might have to go back up to the top. I'll go look real quick. Genesis chapter 49. I apologize for the... What you got? You got the first? Judah. Judah, verse 9. Yeah, got it? All right, cool. All right, so what I wanted to share with you real quick, since we're talking about kings. So again, what, what, what I'm trying, the point that I'm trying to make, I know that I've gone a long way about it, is that he pointed out in the lineage about the priest that came from Levi and about Judah right, that, where the kings come from. And this is a, have you ever heard of the Jacob prophecy? Okay, this is the Jacob prophecy right here. Jacob, who was Abraham's grandson, okay, so really and truly, Levi would have been Abraham's great-grandson. So, so Jacob is pronouncing a prophecy over his sons who would become the 12 tribes of Israel. He's about to die, and he's talking about each one of his sons. And he's laying his hands on Judah, and this is what he says about Judah. The literal Judah, his name was Judah, he was Jacob's son, okay? So we're not using it illustratively to describe the king's tribe. Right now, we're talking about the literal son, Judah. All right, he says, Judah is a lion's whelp. What is a whelp? A cub. Have you ever heard what the Bible talk calls Jesus? Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, the offspring of David. All right, now I'm, I'm trying to bring you backwards. Why do we say that the importance about the kings coming from Judah? This prophecy right here. Okay, Judah is a lion's cub. In other words, when he grows up, watch out. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down. He couched as a lion, as an old lion. Who shall rouse him up? Listen, there's going to be a day when this world's going to wish they didn't mess with the cub known as Jesus. All right, next, next verse. The scepter. What's a scepter? Y'all know what a scepter is? Huh? Who holds a scepter? 
Kings hold scepters, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about, the king's staff. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Now, people break down Shiloh to say that the scepter will not depart from the tribe of Judah until it rests in the hand to the one whom it belongs. That's what the interpretation of the ancient rabbis said that the meaning of the word Shiloh means. And unto him shall be the gathering of the people. Dude, that's right there talking about, to me, that's talking about the rapture. That's talking about all of God's people coming together, both Old Testament, New Testament, the resurrection of the dead. Jacob talking about this way back in Genesis chapter 49. Next verse. And it says, binding his foal to the vine and his asses or donkeys colt unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Boy, that's something right there. Look, Revelation chapter 19, verse 13, I believe it is, says that he is clothed in a vesture dipped in blood his garments in wine, his clothes in the blood of grapes. Wine is a type of the blood of Jesus Christ without the, throughout the scriptures. That's why when we drink the communion juice, it's typ- it typifies the blood. It says that his clothes will be in, uh, dipped in garments of wine. The scripture says when he comes back for the battle of Armageddon, I'm talking about Jesus. You understand Jesus is coming back one day. I hope you believe that because it's going to happen. Jesus is coming back one day and it says that he's clothed in a garment that's dipped in blood. Now, whether that blood represents him destroying the nations for the battle of Armageddon or whether that blood represents the blood that he shed on the cross, the, the, the point is, is that he's king of kings and Lord of lords. He's the Judah lion. Amen. Next verse. I think that's his eyes shall be red with wine, his teeth white with milk. The Bible says in Revelation 19 and 13 also that his eyes are like a, a flaming fire. All right. So that's, that's the Judah prophecy that says that the king will come from Judah. That's a big deal. If you're a Bible student, you need to understand that. And I appreciate that y'all are sticking it through this Sunday school lesson. So look, now, now from there, I want you to go to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. Because look, it goes from Judah to David. And he said, and David's on his deathbed right here. Dave, King David is on his deathbed in this verse. He says, when God says to him, this is a prophecy given to David by God. When your days are fulfilled and you shall sleep with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you which shall proceed out of your bowels or out of your insides, and I will establish his kingdom. Now look, this is a dual prophecy. You gotta understand this. Sometimes in the Bible, there's one layer of meaning, and then there's another layer deeper beneath, all right? We're about to shut it down because I've been giving y'all so much information. I'm about to explode your brain, all right? He says, it will establish his kingdom. Now look at the next verse. It says, he shall build a house for my name, Solomon, David's son, built a house for God. So that right there is talking about Solomon. But guess what? Jesus is also building a house, is he not? It says it in John chapter 14. He's, I think it was Philip. I'm shooting from the hip. He said, Philip, he told his disciples, I'm going away. And where I'm going, you know, right? He said, in my father's house are many mansions. I go away to prepare a place for you. And I'm coming back again. And if it wasn't so, I would not tell you. And so I need you to know that Solomon built a house, but Jesus is building a house, amen? And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He's an eternal priest and he's an eternal king and he's coming back for an eternal kingdom. Now, I was going to take it from there. Actually, you can go to, uh, I'm closing with this verse, promise. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 through 10. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 through 10. Because look, we're talk- what, what, my whole message tonight was about kings and priests. Priests and kings. That Melchizedek was a type. That Jesus was the high priest. That he is the high priest. That, that David was a king that Jesus was the fulfillment of that king, right? And, and it, it said Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, and we're going to close with this verse of Scripture. It says they sang a new song. Now we're talking about the very end, my friend. We're talking about the book of Revelation. People are in heaven, and the people are around the throne. 
And the people of God are singing a new song. And this is what they're singing. You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals. You got to understand that when these seals get opened, this is whenever catastrophe is going to start. Famines, wars, the Antichrist. Okay. Thereof, for you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. When, well, listen, when we see that, like some of y'all, I know y'all see y'all. Y'all are like, man, I know what that means because we've been studying that stuff. This is the war that God is waging on this earth right now. The kingdoms of the world are against the kingdom of our God, and God is warring spiritually, and he's taking back the nations. Hallelujah. That's the whole purpose in Pentecost. That's the whole purpose in the infilling of the power of the Holy Ghost so that you and I, one person at a time, one soul at a time, can plant the seeds of the eternal gospel on the inside of somebody's heart and the kingdom of God can be planted on the inside of them and they can be saved and translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Hallelujah. And there's coming a day when he's going to make it right with the nations. Geographically, everything's going to change. They're going to come and they're going to pay homage to the king. They're going to bow at his knee. The kings of the earth are going to bow to Jesus. And they're going to confess with their tongue that he is king of kings and lord of lords. They sang this new song. And look, out of every tongue, kindred, tongue, people, nation. Now look at the next verse. And it says this, and he has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign upon the earth. Now, I promise you I'm closing. I know I've said it three times, but look, just bear with me. You and I are going to, we are, we're kings and priests. We're going to be kings and priests. We're going to rule and reign during the millennial reign of Christ with the Lord. We, we, today is a dress rehearsal. Today we're making a choice. We're choosing sides. Christian, you're choosing sides today. You're going to make a decision. You're either going to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior and serve him, or you're going to reject him, and you're going to be part of that other deal, okay? He, but he's made us kings and priests. Now, I just want to tell you a couple of things. Kings make declaration. Priests intercede for people. One of the things that I, and I want to, I'm going to build upon this later on as we keep moving forward in our journey together. But look, he said this in Luke chapter 9, verses 1 through 2. I'm just going to read this real quick. Then he called his 12 disciples together, gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them that I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. Those are demonic spirits. Jesus said that he has given us the authority to preach the kingdom of God and to have power over demonic forces so that you and I could live in victory. And what I'm here to tell you is this. Uh, listen, whenever, whenever Peter saw that lame man at the gate beautiful, did he say, oh, you're in a bind. You're really in a bind. Let me, let me just stop and pray for you. No, he said this. He said, fix your eyes upon me, man. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. <laughs> Hallelujah. He declared something in the spiritual realm. Now, I don't know if you've ever declared anything and it didn't happen right away, but I just want to encourage you. Well, guess what? Let's keep on declaring. Let's keep on declaring. I'm not trying to talk about confession, like name it till you claim it and blab it till you grab it. I'm talking about you are truly a, a king and a priest and that Jesus said that he's given you authority. And yes, let's pray, but let's also declare the authority of the Lord in our life. Let's declare Angie's baby well in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's declare the children of God free in the name of Jesus. Jesus. I declare my daughter free in the name of Jesus. I declare my other daughter's mind free in the name of Jesus. I declare your children's minds free in the name of Jesus. I declare you and I in walking in victory in the name of Jesus. I declare Satan's head crushed under the feet of the children of God in the name of Jesus. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We give you glory and honor, Lord. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that you're doing a work upon this earth. Oh, hallelujah. We thank you for the Judah king. We thank you for the Davidic king. Sit it at the right hand of the throne room of God until you make his enemies his footstool. In the name of Jesus, we thank you for calling us into this battle. Maybe you're in this place tonight and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're gonna have to, you're gonna have to believe it with your heart and you're gonna have to say it with your mouth. You can invite him into your heart right now. You can say, Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Become my king, become the king of my heart. Maybe you're sitting in this place and you would say, I've been a Christian for a long time, but I have not given Jesus the throne of my heart. Let us all say it together. Jesus, have the throne of my heart, oh Lord God. Teach us your ways. Fill us with your spirit and use us, oh Lord God, in these days. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.